So if you just leave it here, and it's just kind of like hanging out there. Okay. I'll do. Sure. Sounds good. Um, sounds good. It's just just coach for now, but I have good good call from the report. Hey Craig, when would be good to start doing opening remarks? Eleven fifty five it starts, right? Sounds good. Take coach up and then put players Once coach in. Is off, we put, I'll move the two next to each other. And then okay, and if you put it up like that, that'll help. Yeah, that's perfect. That's good. Okay. Test, test, okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Boston Regional, hosted by Boston College. Just a couple quick remarks before we get started here. Uh, as a courtesy to your fellow media members uh, and team participants, please silence your cell phones. Um, Please provide your name and media affiliation each time you ask a question during the press conference, and please wait wait for one of our uh, mic holders. If you are joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We will address questions in the room first and get to Zoom if time allows. And recording press conferences on cell phones or cameras is prohibited. We'll be joined by head coach San Diego State, Brian Dutcher, here in about a minute or so.
Welcome, Coach. Thank you. So whenever you're settled, if you want to give uh, any opening thoughts, remarks, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, everyone's going to ask us about getting back at 4 in the morning and traveling five hours uh, to get here, and I would just say this. It's a blessing. We're grateful for everything that's come our way. We've worked hard to earn it, and we're thankful to be here and excited for an opportunity to play a really good UConn team. Thanks, Coach. Take some questions here right up front. Bryce Miller, San Diego Union Tribune. Dutch, last year you guys were in this exact same spot in this round. You played the number one overall seed in Alabama. What potentially did you learn, you know, from the mindset and preparation you needed? I know it's different opponents, but just being in that spot and, and what takeaway from that Alabama game might you be able to utilize here? Well, first of all, I wish we were playing in Louisville. That'd be a little further for UConn. But, no, we're playing here and we're excited for it. Uh it's two different opponents. I mean, uh, Alabama was a lot younger. Uh, UConn's way more experienced, having won a national championship, had these kind of moments already. So in that regards, it's different. Uh, the talent level's really close to the same. You know, both programs put guys in the NBA off their teams. And so uh, it's a different kind of a feel. But, uh, again, uh, we're grateful to have a chance to try uh, to – play against a really good top seed for this tournament. Take right here in front left, Coach. Dave Borges, Hearst, Connecticut Media. Brian, for those of us who haven't really seen Jaden play much this season, can you talk about how he's just blossomed from a guy averaging seven points off the bench at 21 and a half this year and an All-American candidate? Just his, his gradual improvement over this season and how different a player he is now? Yeah, and this is to Jaden's credit more than anything. He was capable of doing a lot of this last year. But I had Matt Bradley on the team, and, and he dominated the ball a lot, and with good reason. He was a really good player. And I didn't need Jaden dominating the ball, too. And so he waited his turn. He was patient. Uh, he kept putting his work in. And so it's not as big a surprise to the coaching staff as it, may, as it is to maybe the country as a whole that Jaden is this good. We knew he was this good. He was just waiting for his opportunity. And that's a credit to him uh, to be willing to do that. Right here, sure. Brian, John Fanta from Fox Sports. When you think about, to that point, on Jaden, what he's being asked to do, how that's different, along the lines with this team, you come off of an amazing run of last season. There's obviously an increased attention, pressure, spotlight, whatever you want to call it. What's it say about this group that in the challenge of their league, that, that through the ups and downs of a season, that you are in back-to-back Sweet 16s? Yeah, it's, it's a credit to the kind of kids we recruit. You know, they're hard workers. Uh, they can deal with adversity. I mean, we got beat a lot this year in hard road environments and uh, took everybody's best shot, and, and not unlike Connecticut. They took everyone's best shot, but they won a lot of those games. That's why they're the top seed. Uh, we won enough of them to earn a five seed, uh, but it's been a challenging year because everybody uh, knows that we played for the championship last year. Everyone knows uh, what we've done in the Mountain West, and so – I think all those moments have prepared us for this moment, hopefully, that we played hard environments, we played hard games, and we somehow uh, been able to stand on two feet and continue to win. And that's our goal for tomorrow is to find a way to stand on two feet and win. Coach, right here in front. Gavin Key from the London Day. How much can it help in your preparation that you did just play UConn fairly recently in April? And I know the personnel is a little different, but can, can that help you? Well, hopefully there will be some uh, familiarity with them. From last year, a lot of the same players back, a lot of the same system. They play a lot the same way. You know, Danny's done an incredible job. And so we kind of know what it looks like. We know how hard it is. And, you know, as much as they ran through the tournament last year, dominated pretty much everybody, we felt with five minutes ago it was a five-point game. We put ourselves in a chance to win. And so hopefully tomorrow we'll do the same thing. Hopefully with five minutes to go in the game, we'll have an opportunity to win. Right here, Phil. How important is a guy uh, potentially like Darion for you? I mean, he was huge last year when you played Alabama. He hit the big free throw against Creighton. It seems like when he plays a, a complete game, shoots it well from three, you guys are you know, more difficult to guard, and, and uh, potentially that you know, works to your advantage when he plays like that. Yeah, I've got the starting backcourt from last year's national championship runner-up. I've got Lamont and Darion back, and that's a good place to start. 
You know, two guys that have been in big games that have uh, had important moments in the NCAA tournament. Obviously, Darion, MVP of the South Regional, Lamont Butler's shot against Florida Atlantic. They've been in these moments. And so they're not going to be afraid of the spotlight. They're not going to be afraid of their moment. And hopefully they have that kind of uh, one shining moment that will allow us uh, to get a victory tomorrow. Right here in the middle, Coach. Matt Rebeltowski with Forbes Sports Money. Brian, congrats on returning to the Sweet 16 again. In terms of NIL, you were at Michigan when there was a famous anecdote about Chris Weber and how he couldn't afford his jersey at the campus bookstore there. So it's going back 30 years or so, but how much empathy did you feel for him then? And how much did, does that story buttress the argument that teams like San Diego State should play in the Vegas NIL tournament next year? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think one of the reasons I'm sitting here is I've adapted to every rule change there's been for a lot of years in college basketball because I don't make any of them. But I've found a way to adapt. We've found a way to adapt. And, you know, obviously back at Michigan, uh, the Fab Five generated a lot of income and they couldn't benefit it on any of it. You know, selling of their jerseys, their likeness. And, you know, so they were truly the first a team that probably had uh, uh, the ability to make money on what they did for college basketball. Unfortunately, they couldn't do that. And so now to see where it's at now, uh, it's a good thing. But it, it, to a degree, you know it's not NIL. It's it's what the NCAA always kind of stood against, boosters playing players. So we, we, we can walk around NIL, but the game's changed. And so you have to adapt to it. you got to try your best to give your guys opportunity uh, to make money playing basketball, uh, but try to do it the right way where you're not uh, spoiling them, uh, where there's still a hunger to, to try to achieve something other than that. And the, the greatest goal we have in college is to graduate our players. And so uh, uh, there's nothing wrong with making money uh, playing basketball from an NIL standpoint, but the transfer every year, every year, they're not going to graduate in four years. You, you go to four colleges in four years, you're not going to graduate. You're not all your credits are going to transfer. So our mission has to be to graduate student-athletes. They're not all going to make a living playing pro basketball. And uh, maybe as a young person, you can't appreciate that as much, but our goal has to be to graduate players. And if they can make money and we can help them do that without just getting caught up in your next stop in college basketball, I think that would be a good thing for all of us. Um, you're laser focused on U UConn now, but how much interest do you have in playing in that tournament next fall? I think we have to, you know, I think we have to, to stay relevant. We have to raise NIL money, uh, in order to uh, stay competitive. And like I said, there are rules that we all deal with some college coaches like, and don't like, but it's the rules we're dealing with. And so, uh, for us to have an opportunity to generate NIL money for our players is a good thing for us. Here back, Coach. Hey, Coach. Kyle Hightower from the Associated Press. Uh, along those lines, um, we we'll talked about some of the changes and stuff in college basketball over time, and some of your you know, fellow coaches have gotten out of the business you know, in recent years because of, for various reasons. But for you, a guy who's been an assistant for a long time, been a part of a national championship team already, what keeps you coming back and want to be a part of this world and be a part of college basketball you know, as much as you've already accomplished since, as, as a, in your career as a coach? You know, at this point in my life, at 64 years old, I'm just trying to help young people. And, you know, uh, I'm not out chasing jobs. I'm not out there trying to self-promote. I'm just trying to help everybody around me, my assistant coaches, the players that I coach, uh, trying to make a difference at our university, uh, trying to do the right things and, and, and make a difference in people's lives. And that's all I'm really trying to do. We're back here. Back left, Coach. Hi, Tara Sullivan from the Boston Globe. Um, I know you don't get to make the rules, but if you could tinker with the transfer portal situation, what what do you think is a, is a better case scenario or a best case, or is there one? I, I don't I don't think it's good for any of us to have free agency every single year, because then we're going to lose sight of graduating players, and their credit. Like I said, their credits aren't going to transfer. Not all of them. You could go from one school to another. I don't care if you're going Ivy League. Uh, 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 to a non-Ivy League school, not all your credits are going to transfer. And so we used to have the sit-out year, and you could catch up academically and graduate from that school. And the one-time transfer I'm good with, but once we got rid of 
You know, you had to sit if you transferred twice. I think that's not a good thing because the mission has to be to graduate from college. And they're all sitting in that locker room think they're going to play a long time uh, professionally once they're done in college, whether it's overseas or in the NBA. But the reality is they're going to live most of their lives without a basketball in their hands. And so we have a, a mission to make sure they're prepared for that part of their lives, which young people don't see sometimes. You know, they know it's going to happen, but they don't really know. And so to have all this free agency in basketball, uh, we lose sight of the most important mission we have, which is to graduate student athletes. We've got about five minutes left of Coach. Take one right here. Thank you, Coach. Jacob Feldman from Sportico. I wanted to stay on the transfer portal, and I'm curious for you operationally as a staff, this is now the second year where you guys are advancing the tournament and dealing with potential opportunities in the transfer portal. How have you evolved as a staff to handle that situation? We're t- I'm talking to players in the portal right now. And I haven't done a Zoom yet, but we're trying to set one up. And, and that's the unfortunate thing with the timing of it. You know, teams that are still playing, you know, uh, are, are you have to multitask. You know, I'm 100% focused on this year. But I'm doing San Diego State a disservice and I don't have an eye on the future, too. So I have to multitask. I have to be able to do a lot of things. And, and that's part of the job. So, and, and everybody's dancing into the portal, jumping in there. There's still 16 teams playing that guys from those teams are going to be in the portal too. So the, the process is just starting. It's going to run all summer and, and there are going to be guys jumping in the portal as soon as this round ends from uh, eight schools that don't win. And then uh, four more will jump in and the portal just is something we're dealing with. And like I said, if it was only a one-time transfer, we'd cut those numbers in half. And it would be more manageable. But this is true free agency that not even pro teams would ever, in the wildest dreams, deal with free agents every year. And we're dealing with it in college. Thanks, Coach. Take one more in the room here. Pete? Uh, Brian, Pete Thamel from ESPN. Uh, Charlie Baker, the NCAA president, said this morning that the organization is going to start to work on banning prop bets on individual players. I'm wondering if you had an opinion on that. In, in, you know, Part of it is players getting harassed for not hitting overs and unders and whatever it is. I'm wondering, you obviously play in hostile environments where fans are close. If you saw any of that this season? No, I mean, what these kids deal with with social media in every regards, just their own mental well-being from people complaining about how they pay, how they're playing, uh, missing shots, and uh, they just get beat up constantly. And we all see what social media does to the youth of this country. So just because they're uh, kids with big bodies doesn't mean they're not affected by social media, uh, uh, by pressures outside of uh, the small world they live in. And so, yeah, we're all dealing with problems that that occur with social media, and whether that's prop bets that they're, uh, uh, people are, are texting them and, and, and posting stuff, yeah, it's unfortunate. Thanks, Coach. We'll take one more in the room. We're going to try and take one from Zoom real quick. Um, to pigeonhole, pigeonhole off the, the question, how concerned should coaches like you be at the Temple report that came out related to um, suspicious betting trends? And should there be preventative measures in terms of seminars to educate players on some of the perilous characters that are out there from point-shaving syndicates and places like that? Yeah, well, this is the one thing that's not a new problem. Uh, Betting on sports has happened for a long, long time. And so I think we've done a good job staying ahead of it. You know, we mentor our kids. We we have uh, 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 gambling uh, uh, talks uh, about the dangers of it, about people reaching out for information from them. So this is the one thing I think we're probably all ahead of the curve on. And obviously – uh, we're seeing uh, uh, that they're able to track these things through cell phone records, and and I think we're ahead of the curve as far as monitoring betting in athletics. Thanks, Coach. We're going to take, try and take one here from Zoom. Uh, Brandon, if you want to click the prompt to speak, go ahead when ready. Hello, Coach. Good to see you. Boston looks good on you. Um, two questions for you. First, I'm wondering if you could provide some clarity on Coach Chris, if he's left for Long Beach, um, what his status is with the team. And the second question is, after what you've been through in 2011, 2023, have you been relishing this opportunity now to get this shot at UConn and to climb that mountain? Where has that been in your mind? Uh 
First of all, with Coach Acker, obviously we're excited that he's a candidate for Long Beach State, amongst other jobs. And and I take great pride in that, that uh, that you don't have to go from a Power 5 school to get a head job, that you can get one from San Diego State. And like I said, we may not be in a Power 5 conference, as to speak, but I feel like we're a Power 5 school. And so I like the opportunity that our coaches are getting and hopefully we'll continue to get to uh, uh, become head coaches from San Diego State. I take great pride in that. As far as UConn, uh, it's like a repeat. I mean, we got to do what they did to us. We had them in Anaheim with Kemba Walker and a chance to beat them uh, close to our home. Uh, we played them in L.A., obviously, in Anaheim, and, and they beat us. They beat the Kawhi Leonard team, and so uh, we're in their backyard now, and hopefully uh, we'll have an opportunity to beat them uh, close to their home. Thanks so much, Coach. Good luck tomorrow. All set. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Momentarily, we'll be joined by Jaden Ledee, Lamont Butler, and Darion Trammell. How's it going, guys? Just, uh, just grab a seat right next to your name tag there. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, gentlemen. Let's open up the floor to some questions. Anyone here? Right here in the middle. John Shea for San Diego Sports 760. I guess for, for each of you, what's it like to have a second opportunity here against Connecticut? I'll take it down there, Lamont. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, definitely a blessing, you know, to be here in the Sweet 16 again. Uh, you know, to be able to play UConn again is, is great, too. You know, they, they took us down last year, so uh, we definitely want some revenge back a little bit. But, uh, you know, it's, it's an honor to be here, I and mean, we can't wait to play. Yeah, just going off of the mindset, I mean, it could have been anybody. It could have been UConn. It could have been, you know, Kentucky. It could have been, you know, boys, Girl Scouts. It don't matter. I mean, just, you know, being here in this position, it's a blessing, you know, for us to be together and, you know, have fun and enjoy this game together is a blessing. Yeah, no, it's a blessing uh, just to be here back-to-back. Uh, -back. Um, not a lot of teams can do that. Not a lot of teams make this tournament. Um, so it's just an opportunity to, to show who we are as a team. Um, I think we're just super excited for that. Thanks. Right here, front left. Right, right behind you. There you go. Jada, um, does it feel different for you this year? Just, you know, last year you were essentially coming off the bench and not as big, key, key playing as a key role, and now, you know, leading scorer, one of the top players in the country. Does it feel like a little different going against you kind of this time? Um, I mean, not that much. I mean, like I said, uh, we all have a role, and uh, I feel like last year, like I said, the team was so good, and uh, the team this year is really good. So, I mean, we all got a job to do, and I'm just go out there and do my job. That's it. Right here on the left here. Hi. For any of you who might feel up to answering it, uh, Tara Sullivan from the Boston Globe. College basketball has enjoyed its best ratings ever, again, during this um, 
tournament. But at the same time, you know, we all know there's a million different issues going on from, you know, a suit at Dartmouth to unionize to NIL to transfer portals. Do you guys sense sort of being in the middle of a game that's changing or do you just focus on yourselves? Are there any things you would like to tell people about kind of the state of college basketball? <laughs> First of all, I like to, the way you said tournament. It's like ton, tournament. <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> yeah, you <it> said tournament. <laughs> but, uh, um, I mean, you know, we, we kind of just focus on, you know, going in every day and, uh, you know, being the best version of ourselves. Um, you know, NIL has kind of changed basketball, you know, in a way it's, it's different. I mean, you know, we're able to, to make money off our name, image, and likeness. So I think that's a blessing in itself. Um, you know, people use it in different ways. I feel like I use it in the right way. So, uh, I mean, uh, like I said, I'm just trying to go out there and, you know, play my best basketball and, uh, you know, set myself up for the future. Jaden or Darren, do you have anything with that? No, nah, mine got it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anything else right here? Bryce Miller, San Diego Union Tribune. Jaden, how different can this team be on any given night when the guys on either side of you are, are playing well? They were big in, you know, obviously Darion last year against the number one overall seed, Alabama. Lamont has the big shot in the Florida Atlantic game. They they can kind of potentially change the dimension of trying to guard and compete with you guys. Yeah, I mean, if – you know, these two guys next to me are going to be really hard to beat. I mean, at San Diego State, we're going to, you know, lock up. We're going to play hard. So, if we, you know, these two guys next to me hitting shots, I mean, it's not really much the other team can do. So, yeah, that's, you know, it makes it really tough to beat. Do you have any questions, student athletes? Right here in the front. Uh, Dom O'Mori from the Hartford Current. Lamont, how is your team different from the team that played UConn last year? I imagine more experienced, more mature, but how is it different? And to the degree that you've seen UConn, how do you think they're different from what you saw last year? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we're very versatile offensively. Uh, I mean, we got a bunch of scorers that can, you know, put the ball in the basket at any time. Uh, you know, Jaden's been playing unbelievable, but, uh, you know, Darion, Micah, um, you know, myself, Reese, I mean, we have guys that can really score. Um, J. Powell, Elijah, they, they've been playing well. So uh, I think defensively we're kind of still, um, you know, dominant there. Uh, I mean, of course, we lost Nate and, you know, A.G., Kishad, and guys like that who, uh, you know, really put their best effort forth. But I think uh, in our own way we have our, uh, you know, our, our own defensive identity. And then, uh, you know, UConn, they're, they're still really good. I mean, you know, they lost some, some NBA guys, but, uh, you know, they only lost three games this year. And, you know, they're playing very well uh, at a high level. So, uh no, we can't wait. Uh, it's going to be a great game, and uh, hopefully we come out on top. Anything else out there? Right here. No. Hey, guys. Marley Weirdo with 7 News in Boston. Um, Coach had talked about, you know, the traveling, and you guys are getting in at 4 in the morning, and obviously it's it's a grind to, to travel cross-country for a game, but you guys are playing in one of the most iconic sports venues in the country, one of the most iconic sports cities, uh, arguably, in the world. Do you feel that kind of buzz, or did you feel any of that um, when you arrived here? And anybody that wants to take this question. Um, no, I mean, like you said, it's a blessing to be here. So, I mean, flying across country, it doesn't matter, like, Coach said earlier, we, we flew like five hours, we flew 10 hours to come play. So, like, it's just great to be here. And, you know, we've, I think most guys have never been to the East Coast. So, you know, just seeing the culture and the, how it's different than, you know, the West is real cool. So, I mean, we're just really happy to be here. We'll monitor anything. You're all set with that. Okay. Any other questions? You're all set. All right, guys, you can head back. Good luck tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thank you, guys. Just quickly, Hammond Communications will be posting a recording of this press conference in the NCAA Media Hub at ncaa.veritone.com. And transcripts will be provided by ASAP and will be posted shortly. Thanks so much for joining us. See you in a little bit.
Sadly, I'm staple here.
good spot. No, no, what, actually what I thought is maybe start swing from that side or that side up to me. Will that work as a transition? Will that work? Yeah. And I'm just going to say, all right, I'm here to take any questions, any questions. Nobody wants any answers from me. This is where the players and the coaches do their press conferences. Ready? All right, three, two, one. One. All right, I'm ready to take any questions you have, any questions at all. That's what I thought. Nobody wants any answers from me. This is where the players and the coaches hold their press conference. Okay. Ready? Take questions, questions, anybody, any questions. Just what I thought. Nobody wants answers from me. This is where the players and the coaches hold their press conferences.
Test, test. Thank you. Just for those out in the media area, we're going to have all five UConn starters joining the podium here in about three to four minutes. Thank you. Just quickly before we begin, as a courtesy to your fellow media members and participants, please silence your cell phones. Uh, when asking a question, please provide your name and media affiliation. Uh, please wait for one of our mic holders to get to you, please. Thank you. If you're joining on Zoom, please use the raise hand function for questions. We'll address questions in the room here first and get to Zoom if time allows. And recording of press conferences on cell phones and cameras is prohibited. We'll have 15 minutes here, starting about 1.10. With five starters of the UConn, freshman guard Stefan Castle, sophomore center Donovan Klingon, redshirt sophomore forward Alex Caravan, 
graduate guard Tristan Newton, and graduate guard Cam Spencer. for coach, I believe. This is, here, let me show you. Try it, Jimmy. I'm trying. Take a seat next to your names or fellows. Thank you. Once everyone's settled here, let's open up the floor to some questions. Would you like to start? Right here in front. Dave Borges, Hearst, Connecticut Media. Um, for anyone, but maybe particularly Alex or Donovan, just because you might be guarding him more. Uh, what, what do you see from the kid from, I don't know if it's Lede or Lede, um, what do you see from him uh, as, as far as being a potentially tough matchup for you guys? Um, I mean, he's physical, uh, could score all three levels, uh, puts the ball on the floor, he could get to the rim off the dribble. Um, you know, he attacks the offensive and defensive glass at another level. Uh, you know, he's he's a great player. Um, much respect for him, and, you know, I just got to really lock into this matchup. Yeah, like Donovan said, he pretty much covered it all, but he's probably the most improved player in the country so far this year, and just the jump that he made from last year to this year, it's really remarkable, and, I mean, he's an outstanding player, and he's definitely a key focal point for us. Take one right in front here. Uh, Joe Ruda, Hartford Current. Tristan, obviously you had a good game against San Diego State last year in the title game. Um, just to be playing them again, sort of what are the feelings there? Did, do you think about that game a lot leading into this? I mean, no, not really. They had a whole different team last year, and, then, you know, so did we. I feel like, you know, last year I was um, probably like, the, the, like one of the third or fourth options, that, so they weren't really, like, you know, worried about me last year. And then I have a different role this year, so um, I don't really think about that game, but, you know, just... Just gonna go out there and do whatever I could do to, you know, help 
the team play. In the back. Just what's it like having this in your backyard, and how many fans are you expecting uh, for the game? Yeah, um, super excited to play in Boston. I think what, probably the only chance I get to play with UConn in Boston, so it'll definitely be special. But at the same time, it's a Sweet 16 game for us, so you know we're just locked in as if it was in any other location. And I'll have a, I'm trying to get a lot of friends and family. I don't really know the number yet. Do you have a question right here. Um, Zach Braziller, New York Post, for I guess Tristan um, and Cam. What what has Hassan meant meant to this team? You know, he was uh, obviously a big recruit coming out of high school and didn't quite, you know, I guess meet expectations at A&M and has really kind of blossomed with you guys. What what does he mean to you, your team? Yeah, I mean, he means a lot. You know, he's the, he's the, he's the voice of our team. He, you know, he comes off the bench and he does great things. He plays great defense and um, like he's a great teammate. I feel like number one thing that he does, he's, he's a great teammate. He's a leader. He's positive on and off the court. So um, he's a good friend of mine. And. Um, he's really done well here. Yeah, I mean, like Tristan said, Hassan's a, a great teammate, you know, a very hard worker. Always seems to come in off the bench and, and give us the spark that we need. You know, he's just somebody that is always making winning plays, you know, whether it's an offensive rebound, defensively, you know, knocking down shots. He really does it all for us, and, you know, he's been great for us all year. Jimmy? Go see you to press. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but the president of the NCAA said today that uh, – he wanted to eliminate prop, player-based prop bets uh, for games because players get has, hassled um, from fans who maybe lost their bets. Because have you, has anyone ever had that happen to them? That someone reached out to them and said, "Hey, you cost me money" or anything like that. And would you like to see prop bets, prop bets banned? Hmm. No, I mean, no one's really reached out to us. You know, so really no comment on that right now. You're in front. Gavin Key from the London Day. This is for Donovan. Donovan, you've really stepped up your game the last few games or so what's been the difference for you I'm um, really just you know it's a lot at the line and you know I've really felt the best I felt in a long time um you know healthy feeling light um moving around the floor better um you know and we're competing for the best of the best right now and you know we're trying to do special things and you know really I'm just trying to impact the game any way I can and help my team win right here to the right yep. Alex uh, Steve Buckley from the athletic uh, something just popped into my head you mentioned tickets mm -hmm and uh, accommodating people. I'm, I'm guessing with a big game coming up, you've designated somebody in the family to handle all that. Who is that person and how does that all work out? Yeah, my mom, she's been helping me a lot with the tickets and um, she's telling people yes and no, but um, all these guys up here got a lot of tickets too, not just me. So, you know, we're letting other people figure it out. We're just more so focused on San Diego State. And, you know, we don't really talk about tickets or really try to focus on that at all. Do you have veto power on the yeses or the noes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she's got all the power and who can come or not. <laughs> right here. Matt Reibeltowski with Forbes. Uh, congrats on the return to the Sweet 16. For Donovan or Stefan, um, you guys are laser focused on San Diego State right now, but in terms of NIL, there's a proposed eight-team NIL tournament in Vegas next year. How intrigued are you by events like th like that? Is that something that you would be interested in participating in? Um, I mean, I just uh, I don't really understand it. I don't know what's going on, the rules behind, and all that stuff. Um, you know, and right now it's hard to think about other stuff, other games rather than San Diego State. And you know, I, like I said, I don't understand what's going on in that tournament. And you know, I, like I said, it's no real comment on that one. You're in the middle, okay. Hey guys, Marley Weirdo with uh, Seven News in Boston. Alex, I know you're playing in your backyard, but for the rest of you guys, the university is, you know, practically here in the East Coast, and you could say you're all playing in your backyard, so to speak. Um, how much do you think it'll help having this alumni base, having the fan base be here and help you when you are playing on a Sweet 16 stage? Uh, for anybody that wants to answer that question. Um, yeah, it's super important for us. That's why we worked so hard this year. So we knew in the beginning of the season that we can go from Brooklyn to Boston. And, um, you know, having the UConn fans was definitely a major reason why we wanted to, you know, work so hard in the off season, just having them in our background too. So, um, yeah, just super excited to have them come up to Boston. We'll definitely need their support. We'll definitely need their energy. From the back. Uh, Brandon McGear, Pawtucket Times. This is for any of the players. Obviously, much has been said about the Big East only getting three teams in the NCAA tournament. 
What does it say about you guys and also Creighton and Marquette, the three entries still alive at this point? It speaks to the to the power of the league as in general. Um, I mean, I feel like it just shows what type of league the Big East is. Um, you know, we got a lot of high quality teams with you know teams that should have been in the tournament and um, you know teams playing at a high level. Um, you know, and I feel like I, we're just proving you know how physical the league is, how good the league is, and you know showed everyone that we could you know compete against any. Any conference and any competition. You heard from? Dom Amori, Hartford Current. Uh, Steph and Cam, if you could kind of both speak to this, but when your coach, you hear your coach say that you guys have made yourselves bulletproof, uh, as players, how does that uh, hit you? Does it fill you with, you know, more confidence? Does it give you more confidence when you go into and knowing that your coach is kind of willing to go out on a line like that? Uh. I mean, for me, it gives me a lot of confidence just knowing that, you know, he has that kind of, you know, thought process for us going into these games, you know, knowing how, how good, how talented we are, knowing that, you know, if we just stay connected that, you know, we feel like we can win any any kind of game, you know. I feel like um, I feel like we're the best team in the country, and I feel like that's what he kind of meant by that, you know, just sticking to what we do. And I feel like um, we could beat any team in the country when we do it. Yeah, I mean, like Steph said, I think, you know, coach brings up the bulletproof part when you know we are when we're at our best defensively, and I think we lock in on that end of the floor. You know, I think that um, is kind of when we're at our highest level. So, you know, going forward, I think uh, you know any team can be beaten, but you know we're we're pretty confident that if we lock up on that end, then we're we're the best team. We have about five minutes left to determine the questions. Take one right here in the middle. Um, Zach Brazil in your post, Donovan. What what is this day? you know, March 27th mean to you? Yeah, I mean, it means a lot. You know, uh, six years ago today, I lost my mom, and, you know, that changed my life forever. Um, you know, I really wasn't the biggest fan of basketball, and, you know, I, I loved it and enjoyed playing it. But, you know, really, when she passed, it made me realize how much I love basketball and, you know, give me a reason why to be great and, um, you know, how to, you know, just give me – you know, reason to go. Um, you know, she was a big basketball player in Maine and, you know, had a great career. And, you know, instead of going to WNBA, she wanted to have kids and be a mom. So, um, you know, she had me and my sister. And, you know, I just try to, you know, live, live her name through the game. Why, why did her passing make you love basketball more, really go more into it? Yeah, I mean, it just, just some gave me a reason to make her proud and, you know, gave me a – Gave me a way to represent her and, you know, feel like I saw an attachment to her. Um, you know, she she was you know, the best mom anyone could ask for. And, you know, she influenced me in so many ways. And, you know, I'm just hoping to make her proud. If there's no other questions, anything else? Let me take, we'll take one more here. Back right. Um, <clears throat> Mark Sigler, Union Tribune for Tristan. Uh, last year's game, San Jose closes to five with five minutes to go. Uh, you guys were on a play for Justin. Yeah, I think you had the assist on that play. Could you just take us through that play and, and how important was that three uh, to kind of put them away? Yeah, I mean, we, <clears throat> throughout that game, we ran a lot of plays for Jordan to um, get shots. You know, he was he was one of our best players on the court. And uh, we know we needed a, 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 a shot to, you know, separate the lead. Um, we were up pretty much the whole game, and they started to come back. And, you know, Jordan was one of our – well, he was our best shooter last year, so – you know, it was, it was a good play, and uh, Coach Drew a good play for him, and he, he knocked down a shot, so it, it was a big play in the game. Take one last one here in the back, right, fellas? Hi, guys. Ian Steele, ABC6, Rhode Island. Uh, for anyone who wants to speak on it, uh, Andre Berry and Malik Martin, what have they done for the team throughout these, these past couple of years for you guys? Um, I mean, they, they push us. Um, you know, off the court when we're not practicing and stuff, you know, we're just doing individual workouts and, you know, trying to expand our game as many ways as possible. You know, they've pushed us off the court and, you know, tried to help develop us, develop us into better players for this team. Anyone else in there? All set? All right, first of the questions, you guys can head back. Thanks so much. Good luck tomorrow. Appreciate it. Thank you. We'll have head coach Dan Hurley join us here in about two to three minutes. Thank you.
Coach Nivir, so if you want to just give some opening thoughts, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, obviously excited to, uh, you know, excited to get into Boston last night and, um, you know, the rematch of the, uh, you know, last year's title game. Um, it's funny, I think, uh, you know, since, you know, we, we, both programs have played like the maximum amount of games almost. I don't know if they got to the conference championship game in their league last year, but since that championship game, we both got to the you know, finals of our conference tournament, um, you know, and obviously, uh, you know, coming back from that, that game last year, you know, uh, we've both gotten to, uh, you know, this game again. So uh, a lot of respect for San Diego State and coach and their culture. Um, I think it's an a, a awesome matchup. The Sweet 16 has all great matchups. Thank you. Questions for Coach Riley? Right here in the back, right? I'm Coach Mark Ziegler from San Diego Union Tribune. I just asked Tristan about this. Um, can you take us through last year? It's a five-point game. They close it. People are kind of getting uneasy in the in the arena, and and you called a play for Jordan. Um, what was the play call? Why did you call that uh, in that moment? And and how much did it change the game? Yeah, um, I mean, our people were getting uneasy. I'm sure San Diego State people were were, were excited. Um, yeah, we knew they were going to make a run. They're you know just uh, you know such a good team, such a great program. Uh, culture, pride, um, and that was just uh, an action that we, uh, you know, it was probably our, our second or third counter off of something we call scissors. It was scissors triple. Um, so it was like a scissor action for our point guard, but what we really wanted was, uh, you know, it was, it was a triple for Hawkins, um, you know, and obviously as far as movement shooters goes and clutch shooters, um, you know, they make it hard on you. To get to the rim and score, their defense is excellent at the paint. So, um, you know, that was the call. Where are you left? Uh, Dan, Pete Thamel from ESPN. Uh, Donovan just answered a question about the uh, anniversary of his mother's death. Obviously, that's something that's really shaped his uh, his life and his love for basketball. I'm wondering, you've obviously known him now for four or five years, recruiting him, being a local kid. I'm wondering how you've you've seen him honor her in, in, in that way and just speak to the, the, the depth of her memory and how it shaped him, please. Yeah. Um... Donovan's just, uh, you know, it's just unique personality. Uh, it's, 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 you know, just rare to see somebody that just, that's dealt with what he's dealt with, heartbreaking tragedy, um, and, and then has the, the, the personality that he has. He's so alive and he's so vibrant and he brings so much personality and he's a, uh, He's a total giver. Um, he's just a, just a, a special, unique human being. Even how he handled uh, the way he was raised by his parents and and the community in Bristol. Uh, how he didn't let him get too big for for his is it britches, Pete? Okay. Um, you know, even the way he handled last year at the end of the season, he would have been a top twenty pick. Knew it wasn't ready. Um, Literally the next day, just came in and said, "Like, hey, uh, you know, coach, I'm not ready. Let's let's run it back." There wasn't a meeting with the agent and a series of the drama. You know, he's just a he's a special kid. Right here in the middle. Hey Dan, Mike Abelson, New Hampshire Union leader. Um, two for for you. Can you speak to Solomon's continued development and the way he's evolved as a bench player, uh, as a true freshman, and then? Um, what does Hassan's uh, veteran experience uh, bring off the bench? Yeah, um, just with Haas, we wouldn't be where we are without that veteran, you know, multi-positional guard. Obviously, he's built he's built well for the Big East um, and games like tomorrow because he's physical and he's aggressive, um, and the shooting has improved. And you know, he, you can't win in this tournament without depth. And then Solo. Um, you know, especially in the non-conference solo was awesome for us. We don't win the Carolina game without him at MSG. He was brilliant in that game. Um, you know, league play is tougher on freshmen. Um, but you, you could see a guy that, um, you know, if he stays with us and, you know, and, and trusts the program, he's got a chance to develop into um, a tremendous player at, at UConn. Right here in the middle, Coach. 
Hi, Coach. Marley Weirdo with 7 News in Boston. Um, you guys obviously have geography on your side this weekend. Um, how much of an impact will that make, knowing you're going to have a lot of fans um, at the Garden this weekend, and especially when you're playing on this kind of a stage? Yeah, we, we hope so. Um, you know, we, we certainly hope so. We, we, we hope the crowd could be a, a store's north for us. Um, Maybe feel a little bit like like MSG um, does for us when we play there, um, you know, the Big East tournament, and then during a you know during the Big East regular season too. So um, we've earned that by the season that we've had. Um, this wasn't some like gift uh, by the committee uh, to try to make it as easy as possible for us. We, uh, we we've earned our position. We've manifested uh, you know Brooklyn to Boston. Um, since really April, since last year when we won the championship, and we've uh, worked incredibly hard over that time period to, uh, you know, to earn the opportunity to play in front of hopefully, uh, you know, a, a 60% UConn type of crowd, uh, and then hopefully, you know, Illinois fans and um, Iowa State's fans don't get involved. Right here to the right, Coach. Thanks, Jacob Feller from Sportico. I'm curious for UConn, as one of the top programs in the country, to maintain that status, how important is it for the Big East as a conference to maintain its strength? And going forward, what changes, if any, do you expect to see to make sure that the conference gets the respect it deserves? Yeah, I think we've, we've proven ourselves at the top end. You know, what, what, uh, you know Villanova's not too far removed from a national championship. Obviously, we won it last year. Us, Marquette, Creighton are all vying for it this year. Um, I just think some of the other situations with some of the programs just could take a little bit more time. Thad Mott has made huge strides at Butler. You know, uh, Coach Patino, Kim English, you know, Ed Cooley, um, you know, Shaheen Holloway. We, we, we have people in, in places, Villanova, obviously, with their pedigree. Um, I just think some of our programs um, are, are going to take another big jump uh, this upcoming year. And then... You know, I think the best thing that we could all do is, is schedule the right way with the non-conference, and then, you know, you got to win big non-conference games. Um, you have to. You got to come into league, um, you know, with with some big non-conference wins. You know, we went out and, you know, we beat Carolina, we beat Gonzaga, we beat Texas, before we got to league play. You know, Marquette went out and did, you know, did the same type of things. So we just need more teams performing at a higher level in non-conference. Here in the front, right, coach. Jimmy Golan with the Associated Press. Charlie Baker said today that he wanted to see uh, states ban player-based prop bets because it, it creates pressure on players. Some people are reaching out to players and kind of blaming them for losing their bets. Is that something you'd like to see to take some of the pressure off the players? Yeah, I mean, social media is... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I just think it's uh, social media is, uh, I don't really know what a prop bet is, but uh, social media is vicious, so anything we can do um, just to make it less vicious, I'd be all for that uh, relative to Charlie Baker. Coach right here at the front. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> oh, Tara Sullivan from the Boston Globe. How are you? Tara, what's up? Uh, I read some of your previous quotes about the transfer portal. I'm sorry. I hope you weren't asked it today. If you could change it to a certain way, like what's what's your is it is there an ideal way it it could be better, should be better? What, what do you see? Yeah, I, I think um, we, we could wait to to we get to like maybe the conclusion of the season. That would be nice. Um, it almost feels like in a way right now teams that are really really successful and having great seasons or. It's almost like becoming pro sports where it feels like we're going to have like the last pick in the draft, right? Where we're like a lot of the players will be, you know, will have made decisions because we're not, we're not recruiting. We may be listed by some, some players on some lists of having shown interest, but I know that I don't have interest right now because I'm just, well, you could focus on, I think, um, you know, with, with the way that we function as a program is like on, on our team and coaching the season and, and then we'll make personnel moves, you know, once we're done coaching this group. But, I mean, you can't open up that window until the season's over. Um, you know, I, 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 mean, I don't think you should play in five schools in four years or four schools in four years. I don't think that's healthy for the individual, for the long-term, like, 
50, 60 year life after their playing career is over. Um, you know, because there's no connection with a university, a coaching staff, a network of alumni that could help create opportunities once basketball is over. Um, so, you know, I, I just think, uh, you know, whether it's a one-time tra- I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't like the window being open right now. Uh, and I just don't think it's healthy for somebody to be able to change schools like underwear. Coach over here to the right. Dan, Ian Steele, ABC, Rhode Island. Uh, two guys on your staff with Rhode Island ties, Andre Berry and Malik Martin. What makes them good additions to your staff? What do you see for them in the future in this business? And maybe going back to them when they were younger, you know, uh, pinpoints that you saw. Yeah, I mean, Andre was a championship player uh, for, for, for me at Rhodey and, um, you know, and, and a guy that he didn't have instant gratification. He had to earn a role and develop over time. So he's got a great message for my current players that are either having to earn their role or trying to become a, you know, a high level player. And obviously the Martin family, there's no better family than the Martin family. Hassan Martin's one of my the best and, and greatest players I've ever coached. And that is like the, the greatest Staten Island family of all time right there. Those are incredible people. So uh, anytime, um, you know, you can have that type of connection. Um, it just, it helps your culture significantly. Back right here, Coach. Uh, Adam Kilgore with the Washington Post. Um, how how did uh, the challenges that you went through as a college player shape you as a coach and how you approach your own players today? Yeah. Um, I just think m- maybe sometimes, um, you know, coaches, or play, uh, coaches that weren't the greatest players uh, or, you know, were, were, were pretty good or had their moments, um, but then also went through some struggles. You could just relate to the entire roster um, in, a, in, a, in a unique way, that way, uh, all players at all different points of season. And then I also think, um, you know, when you've had times in your playing career where you've struggled, I, I do think it, it hardens you, it, it toughens you up. Uh, you've dealt with a lot of adversity, and, and uh, you know how to handle failure. And I think as a coach, um, you know, in this business, if you if you can't handle adversity, failure, um, you know, you're you're going to have a very very hard time. So, um, yeah, I mean, bricking all those shots back in at the hall certainly paid off. Right here in the middle, coach. Hey, Dan, one more for you. I had a lot of talk with the the guys. You know, how does last year build into this year? But for you as a coach, what do you learn coaching a national champion uh, that you then take? Uh, into the future because I got good teams at Wagner, a couple tournaments at URI, but reaching the mountaintop, how do you then evolve as a coach and learn from it yourself? Yeah, I just think um, you take the confidence from that. Obviously, we we followed up that with we've been the best team in the country, um, you know, this year and uh, with with what we've been able to accomplish. We're not going to be able to trade that in for anything tomorrow night versus the team we faced last year in the finals. But... um, you know, we, we bring the confidence. Um, you know, we believe, we, we think we're supposed to win these games. Uh, it, and it's like a kind of a double because just UConn, uh, you know, the, the fan base, the organization, the history in, in men's and women's basketball, we truly believe deep down in some, 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 some place that this is what we're supposed to do this time of year. Uh, plus, we did it last year. Um, but then we didn't carry the complacency that other – uh, you know, national championship teams carry with them because since June we've worked like we haven't won anything, uh, and that's I think that's the secret sauce. We have time for about two more. Go right here in the middle, coach. Hey Dan, Matt Reboltowski with Forbes uh, Sports Money. Um, there's there's a new sports book at the XL Center, and Temple has been under investigation for betting activities over the last few weeks. So in in light of that, should there be more seminars and player outreach efforts out there to protect the players from some of the unscrupulous and nefarious characters who are in the environment now? Yes, absolutely. Um, which is how easy it is to gamble on your phone or, you know, again, you know, locally, uh, you know, I, I don't think you could you, you you can do enough that way. So, uh, 
you know, absolutely in light of that, um, you know, we've had internal conversations here at the athletic department about, you know, continuing to, to, to stress that to our student athletes. Right here in front, Coach. <clears throat> Dan, Dom Amore, Hartford Current. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other day I know you referenced making yourselves bulletproof, and today you've talked about how you've earned the position that you're in and the, the, no complacency. How much, with all the success of the last 60 or so games, 50 games, has your job or approach changed to where it's really positive reinforcement now you want to continue to build the swagger and build the confidence that mm-hmm. that your team has because there's, there's not much reason to, to yeah. criticize them. No, I mean, probably some of the big, I mean, you know, my superstitions are stacking up because we've won a lot, we've won so much, so like keeping track of that's been tough. Um, you know, and like last year, we, we were four seed, uh, you know, we we earned a position to have to go out west with UCLA, Gonzaga out there, you know, and had to play Gonzaga in Vegas. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we, we earned the opportunity to be the number one overall seed and, and play in Brooklyn and take buses. Um, you know, I talk about bulletproof. I mean, we're vulnerable. Um, this is not a best of five, a best of seven. Uh, you have one off night. Uh, you know, where everything, you know, falls apart, you know, you, you could be the best team in the country and not win the tournament. When I talk about bulletproof, you know, for me, the formula is top 10 offense, top 10 defense, you know, be a tremendous rebounding team, being a team that plays with, with utter desperation in terms of how hard we play, and then having depth to survive, you know, the other night a two, a two for 22, three point effort, or three, and one of those was you know, from, uh, you know, a walk-on not named Andrew Hurley at the end of the game. So we shot the ball horribly, um, but we were bulletproof the other night because of our defense, our passing, our ability to score rim twos. We can win a, a lot of different types of games. So you want to make yourself as bulletproof as possible in this tournament by just being as well-rounded and as deep. Of course, we'll take one last one here, Bruce. Go ahead. You've been boring. You've been very boring in this press well, I'm not conference. getting the right questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what do I need to ask to liven you up a little bit? Charlie, <laughs> no, it, Charlie it, Baker. There you go. No, we don't, no, want, to, no, we don't no, want to hear no, Dan no, say. No, I'm a Bengal fan. I'm a Bengal fan. Last time, a, remember when I made you do the icky shuffle years ago? That was Mohegan? Yeah. yeah. That was. You I want to do it again? That. No, I do not. No, right. Please, no. Um, this year's team, a lot, of, a lot of opposing coaches will say this year's team is better, scarier to them than last year's. Last year's probably had more high-end talent. Hmm. You agree with that and why? This team fits. Um, I, I just think the, the pieces fit so well. I think uh, a lot of it's been you know, trial and error. The, those, those couple of years when we weren't successful in the tournament, just uh, the, the personalities, the skill set, um, obviously adapting to you know the, the 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 analytics in the modern game from an offensive standpoint, the the growth there as a coach and in terms of roster, uh, you know roster construction. Um, you know there's there's NBA prospects on this roster. I know that you know the um, we were somebody said something about you know being able to win. And we we picked closer to fourth than we were third in our Big East coaches preseason poll. So um, I know well, somebody on ESPN said something we could beat an NBA team or some bizarre shit. That's like uh, that's crazy talk. Um, but uh, yeah, we do have several players on this team that um, are going to play in the NBA, are going to be drafted in the NBA, are going to be drafted in the lottery in the NBA. Um, and and you can't deny when you watch this team play that. It's a fun team to watch because the ball moves and we share it and we play for each other. You could see the culture. You could see the energy. You could see the commitment to defense. You could see the personalities, um, you know, up and down the, the organization. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great team. It's just been a, it, it's been a fun team. I think we've got a, we finally have kind of figured out the formula. Coach, thanks so much for your time. Good luck Thank tomorrow you. night. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> Just in closing, Hammond Communications will post a recording of this press conference in the NCAA Digital Media Hub at ncaa.veritone.com. And transcripts are provided by ASAP and will be posted shortly. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. What's that? I'll talk. Give me one sec. Give me one sec.
Next scheduled time will be 150 uh, with student athletes from Illinois. Thank you.
jerseys in the locker room. Because I got the player. Welcome, Coach. Thank you. Whenever you're settled, if you want to just give a, maybe an opening statement, some thoughts, it'd be great. Thanks so much. Well, obviously very excited to be in, uh, be here in Boston. Um, you felt like we uh, uh, handled business, took care of what we needed to take care of um, in Omaha, uh, two very good opponents. And, um, you know, and I thought, uh, uh, other than the start of the Moorhead game, I thought we played uh, played pretty well. Uh, now it's uh, on to a very, very good Iowa State team. Obviously, the uh, uh, number one defense uh, in college basketball. Uh, they do that for a reason. Uh, TJ has done just an outstanding job of, of, um, uh, of getting these guys to play so very hard. Uh, it's very impressive. Um, you know, as a coach, I watch their team, and uh, I know what they emphasize. I know what they work on. And, uh, um, you know, you beat the number one seed, Houston, twice. Uh, and uh, that's, that's very, very impressive. Obviously, winning the Big 12 tournament, uh, which was the what, number one rated conference this year. So um, my hat's off to to uh, Iowa State, to TJ, to that group, and uh, they're led by two very, very good guards, um, very athletic, and, and a team that, uh, like I said, obviously causes teams um, a lot of problems scoring. So uh, we'll have to be very good and uh, excited for the opportunity. Thank you, Coach. I'm going to take one right here in front, front right. Built a great culture here at Illinois. Can you just talk to us about just what makes you as proud of the culture and just what makes this team so different? Yeah, I, you know, I think we've 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 tried to establish a uh, a work ethic. Uh, we're a program of development. We say all the time we're everyday guys. Uh, you see that throughout our building, on our shirts, on our gear. Um, you know, to, to show up and have to work every single day um, to get better. Uh, to be accountable, to be responsible. Um, that's that's only done by uh, hard work and by a group of guys that uh, that, that want to put in that time and that want to buy into that. They've they've set standards for them for themselves that they want to achieve, not goals, standards. And uh, uh, this group's very mature and handled that. And and uh, you know this group is has been as fun a group as I've ever been around. Um, they've, they've added years to my coaching life, I know that. Uh, just, just simply being, on, being along on the ride with them has, has, has made it fun. And, and uh, they've adhered to everything we've tried to do and listened, and, and that makes it really enjoyable. Coach, front left here. <laughs> Annie Costable from the Chicago Sun-Times. Brad, as more eyes are pulled to your team during this run, do you see any issue with your leading scorer who is a representative representation of this team and this university not being available to the media no um, you know that's that's there that's obviously a very 
uh, serious situation. We're very well aware of that. Um, you know, I think that there's um, uh, com confident. I think there's communication that he has to have with his legal counsel and so on and so forth to, to be aware of, of of what's in his best interest and in moving forward. So, and we're going to adhere to that. And and uh, um, you know, the university's put out. Um, you know their their statements on on those situations, and and uh, you know we're going to adhere to all of that, and and we're going to play basketball and and do it uh, to the best of our ability, and keep trying to win games. Coach, right here in the middle, Derek Piper, Atlanta Inquirer. Coach, as you know, number one offense against the number one defense. What do you guys have to do against them to make sure that that clash of strengths goes to your advantage? Well, they're very good. Uh, you know, they're going to play exceptionally hard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not oblivious to think that we won't turn the ball over a few a few times. Um, you know, you've, you've got to be very decisive in your decisions. You've got to be ball tough. Uh, you got two guys in, the, in their guards that uh, um, do a great job of raking, taking it out of your hands. Uh, they're in constant rotation. Uh, you can't do the same thing every time. They're going to learn, they'll sit on it after a time or two. So, um, you know, and then you've got to try to avoid the, the pick sixes, you know, um, take the five second count. If you're in trouble, uh, punt it, you know, 24 rows up into the stands, uh, you know, just don't jump up in the air and throw it and let them get an uncontested layup that we can't, uh, we can't defend on our end. So, uh, they're good, and um, you know. Then we've got to, um, you know, we've we've just got to be decisive in in our decision making. Just right behind him here, coach. Brazilian New York Post. Brett, what was your reaction to the accusations, and then your reaction to the the court proceedings that allowed Terrence to come back? Yeah, I mean, I've said it many times. I'm a I'm a I'm a college basketball coach, and you know, the when when the we found out, um, you know, it was our athletic director, uh, Josh Whitman, uh, you know, informed me. Uh, then it was uh, uh, to a decision that was that was that was made by the university, and then obviously uh, taken to the courts. And 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 I've said all along I was going to coach uh, the guys I had in the locker room. I was going to be um, uh, the best supporter. Uh, of, of those guys that I coach every day um, and we had to find a way to flourish through those through through, through those tough times and uh, you know then when uh, you know when he came back and joined us uh, he was a, he was a part of our team again he's he's always been a um, a great teammate and and uh, so we um, got him back and, and here we sat today coach right here in the middle Hi, Coach. Marley Weirdo with 7 News in Boston. Good to see you again. Um, Thank you. <laughs> I think part of the novelty of the, the tournament is getting to you know see your path, find out where you might be playing, what cities you get to go to. What's the excitement of playing in Boston, playing in a city like this where it's known for sports and being um, as iconic as it is and also getting to play on the, the Sweet 16 stage? Well, I think there's a lot of things to that question. Um, one... Uh, you're in the Sweet 16. Uh, you're you're in one of the premier sporting events in in all the world, and um, then you get to do it here in Boston. And all you got to do is look up at the rafters, and uh, you're you're doing it in the in I don't know. You start looking up through I don't know 57 or 59, and all the consecutive world championships, and know what this city is about in terms of basketball. Um, you know, Larry Bird and Red Arbach and I, Bill Russell, and you just, you know, John Havlicek, you just keep going right on, right on down the list. And those are all names that are, are synonymous with the greats. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it's great that it's, it's, it's here in Boston. It's in this iconic building and, and, and place. And, um, you know, it coincides with the fact the Celtics are really good again. Uh, this year, but uh, but we're doing it in the Sweet 16, and uh, so really excited about all that. Go ahead. Alec Bussey, 24-7 Sports. <clears throat> nice to see you again, Coach. Um, obviously, I would say it puts a ton of pressure on the ball. How do you prepare for that um, this week in practice? Well, we've got a pretty good one. Sincere Harris is a is a is a pretty good defender, um, and um, you know, so we we get to see that. But you don't you you, you can't replicate. 
truly their their athleticism, uh, King, um, all those guys up front um, are, are so athletic and and, and quick. Um, but uh, you talk about doing you know certain things and, and creating certain habits and, and being ball tough. Uh, but um, you know we've got to. Uh, uh, apply all those things tomorrow but it, it 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 you know I think we can with Draven and with sincere we can get after the ball pretty good in practice but um, you know it, it is a little different when you got size and length uh, like that up front coming your front right coach hey Brad can you speak to the challenges of your coaching staff and also yourself with uh, preparing for the sweet 16 matchup but also navigating the uh, transfer portal as well yeah <laughs> yeah I spent all morning on the portal um, believe it or not so um, yeah, it, it, I, I don't know. I, it's unfortunate timing, I think. I, you know, it, it is what it is. It was the, the calendar was put in place for a reason. Um, you know, I, I spent late into last night again on, on Iowa State and, and um, got up early this morning and, and prepped for practice and our workout today and then, you know, I had to work on the portal. And, uh, uh, you know, we know what we're losing. Um, you know, in terms of, of guys eligibility wise, and and so you're you're out making those calls, and and uh, you know there's there's no there's no rest in that. You know, it's um, um, you know when the season's over, it, it gets amped up even more. I mean, there's no downtime. It is it is um, uh, crank it up. So our staff's working hard at that. Uh, we're paying attention daily to what's going on in the portal, and if you're not, you're you're probably falling behind. Are you the middle coach? Brad, on the note of the portal, uh, you, you brought in transfers, and they've had a lot of success, guys. This year, Alfonso Plummer on the the Big Ten title team. Why do you think it is that you've been able to get the most out of those guys? What is it about Illinois as a program that allows them to play their best basketball? I think we've been really honest with them. I think I don't think we've tried to to to. Um, identify, I, I think we've tried very hard to identify high character guys that fit. I think we've tried to find out guys that have specific needs to what we're looking for. And then uh, uh, it's been a great match. It's been a marriage it's, that's worked both ways. And, and uh, um, you know, I think when you're honest with guys, you're not telling them you're going to make them a, you know, a lottery pick or you're, you know, when they're coming from wherever, you're, you're honest with them and tell them how they fit and, and what the pieces are. Um, you know, there's no surprises. And uh, so it's, um, you know, we've got um, a great situation. Uh, we've had success. And, um, you know, I think that there are people out there who, uh, who want to be a part of that. Okay. Time for two more. Let's be here. Uh, Brad, Pete Thamel from ESPN. Uh, Charlie Baker, then say president, came out this morning uh, advocating against prop betting on individual players in college athletics games. And so they were going to move forward to try to make that illegal. I'm wondering, as a coach, if that's something you'd support. 100 percent that's i mean we have we have competitive integrity and and i think that's the one thing that we can we can never uh we can never jeopardize um i think in the big 10 we've 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 been very very proactive in terms of putting out an injury report uh before games uh to help protect student athletes and 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 coaches and uh uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of that. I, w I would hate to see the day where nobody jumps for the jump ball because of a prop bet. And uh, to me, that's uh, uh, the greatness of, of college athletics is the competitive integrity that we have, and we should be able to keep that. Thank We're here to the right, Coach. Matt, <clears throat> Matt Rybaltowski with Forbes Sports Money. Based on your comments there on integrity, how serious – are point shaving allegations across the sport, and in light of the Temple investigation, did that set off red flags for you and other coaches in the the community there when that report came out a few weeks ago? Well, I think it'd be you'd be um, buried in a hole if it if if you weren't paying attention to to what goes on. I think that uh, speaking personally, um, we've got a athletic administration um, has educated, worked as hard as they can work in helping us uh, as coaches educate our student athletes on it. Um, I think that it's, it's, um, um, it's real in, in terms of uh, it, it's, it's something that, that 
if you don't address it, shame on you. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's all we can do is keep talking about it, keep keep trying to educate our student athletes on 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 what's out there and what's surrounding them. And uh, uh, but uh, I know personally, we do an incredible job uh, of talking to our student athletes about all those experiences. And you hate to hear when it when it uh, when it happens, but. Uh, um, again, we're going to do everything at the University of Illinois we can do to try to um, educate our people about it. We'll have time for one more if there's out there. All set. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck tomorrow, Coach. Thank you. In a, about a minute or so, we will be joined by student athletes Marcus Damask, Quincy Garrier, and Coleman Hawkins. Superstitious? Yeah, uh, a little bit. <laughs> That's cool. All right. Whenever you guys are settled, we'll open up the floor to some questions. Right here in the middle. All right. uh, Zach Braziller, New York Post. For any of you guys, um, how would you just describe the way Terrence has played for the last, I guess, month? Um, Big East, Big Ten tournament, NCAA tournament, just like what's been like watching his performance? Um. Personally, I think it's been great. I think uh, he's done a great job of um, just being a, a, a dominant player. Um, I feel like a lot of times it gets tough in the postseason because everybody knows your actions. But we've been keeping everything pretty simple. And uh, he's done a great job of uh, being a reliable source to go out and, and score at, at any given moment, you know, whether a play breaks down or not. And um, seeing his speed, his f physicality, uh, dominate matchups is – it's, it, it's been really great to see, for sure. Question in the back, right? Joey Wagner, 24-7 Sports. This is for both Quincy and Marcus. Uh, Illinois has had a tradition a little bit of having transfers come in here and really thrive. So what is it about the program or the coaching staff that allows you guys to have this level of success coming in here? Yeah, I mean, I think the culture. Um, when I first got here, just everybody was always in the gym. Uh, we set our, our standards for the year, too. And, uh, you know, we really just make sure that we were uh, respecting those standards. And I think that's why I really translate our, our, um, our success to, to those standards. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, coach just leaves no confusion on what's expected. You know, as a one-year guy, you don't have a long time to kind of figure it out. And uh, he leaves no confusion. And then, uh, you know, in the portal, he kind of talks about it. So it's kind of appealing as a, as a one-year guy that to see the success that other guys have had and the way that coach uses us. Right here in the middle, fellas. Derek Piper, Line Enquirer. This is for Coleman. Obviously, you guys are the number one offense in the country. They're the number one defense in the country. What has to happen for you to, to make sure the battle of strengths goes in your advantage? Uh, I think the biggest thing is, is keeping it simple. Uh, I think not trying to hit home runs, um, you know, making the extra pass, and then being uh, what we talk about, ball tough uh, is a big key. Um, you know, live ball turnovers for them lead, lead to buckets, uh, and they score a lot off of those turnovers. Those, we, uh, you know, coach uses the term pick sixes. Um, so limiting those, being ball tough, uh, making simple plays, um, stepping, stepping up and, and knocking down open shots because they're going to come. Um, they're <laughs> they're going to um, – those open shots are going to come uh, <laughs> when – when, uh, you know, they double team the booty ball offense that we have and, um, you know, stepping up, making those shots, um, not turning the ball over is our key to success for sure. Guys right here in the middle of the right. Uh, for Coleman and Marcus, um, Alec Bussey, 24-7 Sports. Good to see you again, Coleman. Yes, sir. Uh, Coach talked about how 
impactful Sincere Harris and Dre Gibbs Lawhorn have been in helping you guys prepare for Iowa State's ball pressure. Can you guys just speak to what they've done in practice to maybe make you uncomfortable heading into Thursday's game? Uh, yeah, I think Sincere does a great job. You know, at times he, 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 he runs around and does his own thing, but you know, when when he's giving us great looks, him and Dre, uh, offensively and defensively, just crawling up in us, um, making our catches tough, uh, and just trying as best as possible to simulate um, those defensive coverages and, um, you know, trying to replicate how hard teams play. And, um, you know, Sincere is always guarding Terrence and Marcus every day. Uh, same thing with Dre. And then offensively, um, you know, making us work extremely hard in practice. Um, sometimes, you know, I hate Garden Sincere because he's like going full speed and, and I'm at like 50% still trying to get warmed up and it's like the first drill and he's already trying to like serve you and, and make you look stupid. But now they do a great job of just bringing the energy and intensity and, and making us work hard. And not only them two, but the whole entire scout team for sure. Annie Costable from the Chicago Sun-Times. This question's for Marcus. Um, I'm curious how your four years at Southern Illinois prepared you and shaped you, got you ready for, for this final year that you're having with Illinois. Yeah, um, you know, I think I came from a really good program. You know, I, I have a lot of respect for, for Coach Mullins and, and the way he ran things and just the way he coached me. Uh, I think he did a really good job of just preparing me player development wise and, you know, as a leader to kind of come in and, and make an impact in obviously the one year situation. Uh, so yeah, I think you know SIU does stuff at a high level compared to most mid majors. You know, through conversations I've had with other people, I've learned that, and I think he, he as a coach, just just really helped me understand the game and, and understand how to come in and impact. John, John Fanta from Fox Sports. Marcus, kind of coming off of that, you obviously have a, an envisionment of what you're going to be at Illinois coming into things, but everything happens so quickly in the portal. What have you found out about this place, this coaching staff, your teammates, that's made this a perfect fit for you? Um, I think, you know, just the way that, that Coach Underwood kind of treats us. Uh, he treats us, you know, more as a professional team than a college team. We're an older team, and he kind of – he allows us to be more player-led than coach-led, I think, and he, he gives us that leeway to kind of control our own destiny and how we operate some things, and he puts a lot of trust in us. So I think just – you know, the, the trust he's put in us just kind of reflects our trust in him, and it's just kind of a two-way street. John, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up. Coleman, the two guys to your left, you know, there's that dynamic with, with programs of guys who are back versus guys who come in. Why have they fit so well? Um, I, think, um, I think they're just being asked to do – um, it's not. It's not like they're being asked to do too much or something they can't do. Uh, I think um, you know Quincy's done a great job of spacing the floor, knocking down open shots, being aggressive when he needs to be, uh, offensive rebounding well, and that's what co coaches told him to do. And then uh, Marcus has done a great job embracing the role of the booty ball offense and taking his time and um, just being being stronger than most guards. Um, um, you know, powering through. Um, um, you know, just using stuff that he works on every single day. Um, so I think just their opportunity and embracing the, the roles that they've been asked to do um, has, has been great and it's worked out well. And, you know, it's kind of morphed us into what we, you know, are today, which is the number one offensive team in the country. So. Quincy, anything on that? So, all right, we'll go right here front right. <laughs> Brian Antique, CS of Sports. Uh, this question is from Marcus and for Quincy. Oh, oh, right. oh, oh, you good, man? Yeah. So just a quick question for you guys. So Brad, obviously, you know, he gets it Terrence about not hitting the uh, defensive boards. Could you just guys talk about just the importance of him doing that and what it does for the offense? I mean, yeah, when he defensive rebound, uh, our offense is way better. Uh, we run in transition, we push the ball, and uh, we don't need him to defensive rebound tomorrow because uh, they're a really good team. Uh, they're crushing the boards at 4-5, or five are really good, so the guard's going to have to come help us and get rebounds. But like I just said, when, when Terrence is rebounding, uh, our offense is, is two different things. 
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, rebounding is a big emphasis that Coach has had since the summer. Uh, he definitely gets on Terrence a lot, you know, just because with Terrence's, you know, athletic ability, when he rebounds and we get on transition, you know, we're just a different team. So, you know, Coach's ability to kind of press the buttons on what he sees and, and what players can be better at, I think is, is just really good. Thanks, guys. Back right here. Mike Abelson, New Hampshire Union leader. Quincy, uh, for you, um, what type of performance do you have to have tomorrow for you to consider yourself to have had a successful game against the Cyclones? Uh, just focusing on rebounding uh, and, and my defense got to be really aggressive, uh, knock down shots. Uh, but it's going to be about all, all about the team. Uh, I think if we, we communicate, we stay connected, and, and we're aggressive defensively and we rebound, uh, we'll have no trouble to, to win the game. Right here to the left. Yeah, Kevin Sweeney, SI. Uh, for, for Marcus, obviously your, your post-up game, it's something you were able to do at, at Southern Illinois, but where, where does that come from? Like, wh how did you develop such an advanced you know, low post game as, as a guard, and how, how has that benefited you at, at the highest level? I give my dad a lot of credit. My dad coached me ever since I was super young. So, And uh, he always kind of talked to me. A phrase he always used was, there's two positions. You're either on the bench or on the court. And uh, he always just talked about how you want to be able to do as many things as possible to stay on the court, you know, and just be versatile. You know, and obviously I have some size. So I think he just did a really good job of coaching me in all aspects of the game. And just, you know, I think that was just one thing that, you know, he really coached me in. Here to the right. Scott Ritchie, the Champagne News Gazette, for Quincy. I know we kind of talked Saturday about your last Sweet 16 experience. And you haven't been in Boston long, but just kind of you compare that year in Indy and the bubble to, to now, just kind of the whole thing. Yeah, it's two, it's two different things. Uh, I remember during COVID year in the morning, we had to wake up, go get COVID tests. Uh, we're in a hotel, couldn't go out. Um, now I feel like I can enjoy more. Uh, the experience because you know we, we're traveling, uh, we got more time for us. Uh, we got time to like go to places and stuff. But uh, just like I said, really grateful to be in that position right now. Awesome. We have time for probably two more if they're out there. Any other questions? Your head cut. I, I guess for any of you guys, it's just kind of a late tip time, 10 p.m. local time. Like, what do you do all day to, I guess, stay ready for that? Nap. Nap a little. Take a nap before the game few hours before the game. That's, that's for me. That's for me. Anyone else? No. Yeah, I'll take a nap. Uh, you know, we'll obviously get up and have shoot around. So, you know, we kind of get our bodies moving, you know, get, get our minds going and then take a nap. And then next thing you know, it's game time. Take one more in the middle here. For any guys, I know that after getting the Sweet 16, you said that this wasn't the goal, that you guys were obviously hungry for more. Do you feel like that has been shown in the lead up, the practices, that you guys got that that hunger and desire that you want? Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we've been practicing really hard. Um, I, I feel like everybody's locked in. We're having fun, too. You know, I think that's really important for us to have fun and uh, just to be dialed in on, on the scouting report. But uh, everybody's been tremendous and uh, the coaching staff as well. One more, take one more here. No, what you guys had back. Yeah, Robert Rosenthal, line at board. Coleman, this is for you. I don't believe Coach Underwood pushed in his chair when he left a little bit ago, and I'm curious if you have a reaction to that. That's disrespectful. <laughs> is this his chair right here? I think uh, Marcus is sitting in it. Mm. <laughs> we'll, in. we'll let him know next time. <laughs> it won't happen again, I swear. <laughs> All right, guys, thanks for your time. Good luck tomorrow. Thank Appreciate you. it. Just in closing here, uh, Hammond Communications will post a recording of this presser. Oh boy, there you go. <laughs> Raised them right. All right. Hammond Communications will post a recording of this press conference to NCAA Media Hub, ncaa.veritone.com. NCAA Transcripts are provided by ASAP will be posted shortly. Thank you for joining us. The next session be at 305, the student athletes of Iowa State. Thank you.
bisschen vom Himmel tut.
Test, test. Five minutes in. Oh, yeah. Those on the waiting area of the media, we'll be getting started here with Iowa State student athletes in about two or three minutes. We'll be joined by senior forward Robert Jones, junior guard Keyshawn Gilbert, and sophomore guard Taman Lipsy. Thank you.
going to get started here in a couple seconds. Just as a quick reminder, when asked a question, please wait for the microphone and please state your first, last name, and media affiliation. Thank you. Once our fellows here are settled, we can open up the floor to questions. Any takers? Right here. In the middle. I guess I can go first to Alec Bussey, 24 seven. Um, for the two guards, um, you guys have talked so much this season about the importance of being able to keep opponents out of the paint. How do you go about doing that against Marcus Damask and Terrence Shannon? I'd say just sticking, to, sticking true to what we have done this whole season and uh, what we do is uh, be physical and dictate, um, go out there with physicality and uh, just what we do, I'd say. Yeah, pretty much same thing he said. Uh, do the same thing we've been working on since June, dictating, being physical, and um, yeah, that's really that's pretty much it. Rob, to follow up for you, when they are able to get their wings or their guards into the paint, what role do you and Hassan play in making it difficult for them to get a shot off cleanly? Uh, same sort of thing. Still that physicality piece. Uh, meeting them at the rim, not letting them get an easy shot off, but making sure we don't foul as well. I uh, can't give him three points at the line. So making it hard to finish without fouling. Right here in the back right, guys. John Fanta from Fox Sports. It's for any of you guys. To have the nation's number one defense certainly is, is impressive. You look at Coach, he's, he's got a he, – he looks – like a, just a great guy, easygoing guy, but but obviously inside the doors of your gym, I got to imagine practices here, very intense. Give us a peek behind the scenes of what an Iowa State practice looks like, and how you guys have grown into the best defensive team in college basketball. I'd say uh, practices are super physical. We go after each other. Everything we do is competitive, uh, starting with our stretch making sure that we keep a high level of intensity, high level of energy throughout practice. Um, and then the, the more intensity we can bring, uh, the, the shorter practices can be just because we have that high intensity level uh, and we're getting a lot of stuff done at a, at a high level during our practices. Like Rob said, uh, every drill we do is a competition. Uh, that, that brings out the best in, in each one of us. And uh, especially those defensive drills, we take a lot of pride in uh, just be, being physical. There's not a lot of fouls that are called, so you really got to go out there and just, just work for it. And who wants it more at the end of the day? And uh, that's where our, our physicality and, and our defensive mindset comes from. You trying to get anything on that? Yeah. All right. I say anything. Cool. <laughs> Any questions here? Right here, in the right. Matt Reibel-Towski with Forbes. Congrats on the uh, great win over UH a couple weeks ago. For all three of you, th there's been a litany of sports betting scandals across the state. Th the uh, quarterback from your school was suspended, but a few players were exonerated uh, from, from, from that case. So just how much has Coach emphasized that if you make one bet, that's it. You could be off the team. It could jeopardize your future NBA potential. It could cost you millions of dollars. Has that been a point of em emphasis this year? I'd say a little bit, especially after what happened with um, the things in our state at the University of Iowa and Iowa State. Just being aware of it uh, is the most important thing. And uh, obviously, we know that that's we can't do those things. And uh, just being more aware and having more people come and talk, talk about it to us and um, just knowing the ins and outs and everything that that's not legal for us to do is, was something that was big for us in the off season. But um, really just at the end of the day, not, not thinking too much about the, the things that had went on and moving on from the stuff that happened at our university and uh, just realizing how we can learn from it. Anything else there? Right here in the middle. Uh, for Taman, I know that um, you didn't play against Terrence when you were in high school as he was at Texas Tech because he's just a sophomore um, and he's in his second year at Illinois. But you obviously remember watching him, I'm sure, and on film. What's the most impressive thing about his game? So there's there's a few things. Uh, definitely just his aggressiveness uh, on the offensive side and his, his playmaking ability. Uh, his speed, he uses speed very well, and uh, that's something that we're going to – key in defensively, trying to stop. Um, he's a great overall player and uh, looking forward to the matchup. 
Go ahead and back, John. John Fant of Fox Sports again. Tayman, when you look at, at from year one to year two, we knew coming in this season, you know, the coach talked about how you were going to take on an increased role for this team, and obviously you have. What was that process like, and looking back on it, and, and what's the reward here of, of knowing that you were going to get the keys to the car and, and that you got, you've been able to drive it here to the Sweet 16? Yeah, there was a lot of talk going into the offseason just about uh, what, what they wanted to get out of me going into my, my sophomore year and uh, just knowing that the trust that the coaches, especially TJ, had and the trust that he was putting in, in me uh, to, to be one of those leaders for this team was, was big for me. So just taking that next step, uh, being a leader, was, was something that was big. And um, I, my work ethic is something that I take pride in and just going out there and just trying to do, do the best I can do and uh, lead by example, I would say. And uh, the team that we have this year has put in so much work, and uh, it's been so easy um, to be a leader of this team because all those guys just put in the same amount of work as me, and um, we enjoyed uh, this ride together. So just to follow up on that, all you guys are talking about how great Otz is. Do you have a favorite TJ story? <laughs> are you guys scared of him? No. More of a respect thing. Yeah, I'd say it's more, of a, it's more of a respect thing for sure, just, just knowing who he is. And I wouldn't say there's any really stories that stick out, just uh, the passion that he shows for, for Iowa State and um, just coming after – out of big wins and stuff, just celebrating with the guys is, is something that's huge. So it's not true that when he walked down, you guys were playing blackjack, having a great time, right? All of a sudden he walks down and Taman gets all scared, doesn't say a thing. <laughs> I, I'd say it's just his, his presence is, is well known uh, from everyone around him, just how he holds himself to that standard. Hey, when, when you were recruited out of high school, you know, Tyrese had just left, and I think a lot of people thought the program might take a step back because he transferred to Texas. Um, how much of a chip in the shoulder was it for you coming in and kind of showing people in the way you do, which is really quietly, that, hey, you know what? Like, I can be as good as him, if not better. Yeah, definitely just having that chip on my shoulder uh, coming in. A lot of people's thoughts were I was going to be back up to him and obviously things worked out the way they worked out and I was able to uh, step in and take that starting role but uh, just the work ethic and the, that chip on my shoulder that I've kind of been under underlooked uh, is, is something that I hold on to and uh, just go out there and, and do what I can do. Take one here in the middle. Um, for either of the two guards you guys obviously just played against one of the biggest teams in the country in Washington State you now match up against another team that's top 10 in the country and, and average height do you feel like having experience against a team that's so tall and long like Washington State so recently can give you such an advantage against Illinois I say yeah because we know we kind of know what to expect they kind of guard the same way as Washington State you know we know we won't be able to you know kind of force it in there we got to play smarter play off two feet and um yeah we know what to expect so I feel like it's, it's definitely a good thing on that. Anything else? Yeah. Yep. Fuck, you good? Everyone all set? All right, guys, you guys can head back. Good luck tomorrow. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Thank you. About three, four, five minutes here, we'll be joined by head coach TJ Altsberger.
Welcome, Coach. Whenever you're settled, if you just want to maybe give us an opening thoughts, a statement, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, great to see everybody today. Uh, truly is an honor to be here. Uh, extremely proud of the young men in our program for the continued hard work and how they re represent our university every single day. Uh, excited uh, for the challenge that's in front of us. And, uh, yeah, ready for any questions. Thanks, Coach. Open up the floor. I get to decline. Uh, yes, quite, yeah. yes, you do. Yep. <laughs> Any that don't come from you. John right here in the back. TJ, John Fanta from Fox Sports. We were talking with Taman, and he, he spoke about the conversations with you, the buildup from year one to year two. How would you speak to this kid's character and the way that, that he's grown into this role as being a leader for this program and what stood out to you the most about that evolution? Yeah, we're really fortunate. When Taman came into our program, so often with freshmen, they have so many things to learn in terms of leadership. And Taman, because of his upbringing, because of his family, foundation, so many great people in Ames, he has so many natural leadership characteristics that he brought in with him as a freshman. And so we benefited from those so much in that first season. And then as you look into year two, and the things I really valued is when the season ended, I think Taman took it really personal. Um, his ability to shoot the basketball is something that some would, would have had in question. And the work that he put in the gym um, and the time that he invested, the pride, uh, you can see it now in the games. Just He's done the hard work, but there's also such a thing as like, your spirit and finding a way to just will shots in like he does based on your character and your hard work. And so he really committed to that. Uh, he knew that he'd have to be more vocal. And I challenge him, you know, to this day about we want your personality to come out more. We don't want you to change. We want you to be the best version of yourself. But it, it'd be great if your teammates get to know more of that because you, you take advantage of more of those opportunities. And that's something that we've continued to challenge them with. And, and I'd say that the final piece is it's a big difference when you're going from, you know, somebody who's a freshman and some other guys are towards the top of the scouting report every single night and you're one of the guys, it's a big step when you're going to be the guy or at the top of that. And knowing the responsibility that goes along with that on a daily basis can't have a bad day, can't have a tough practice, uh, can't have emotional reaction, outburst, can't, um, you know, you've got to be solution oriented and, and always be driven to solve your problems immediately. And, and he's done such a great job of that. Um, there's nobody that could be a, a better leader in terms of character, dependability, and work ethic on a daily basis than what Tame and Lipsy does for our program. Right here in the middle, Coach. Hi, Coach Alec Bussey, 24-7. Um, how much of an impact do you think your defensive glass could play on the outcome of tomorrow night's game? Our defensive? Yeah, I mean, look, there, there's so many elements that happen in the game. You know, we're certainly a program that takes pride in what we call our daily habits, the things that we do every single day. And rebounding is, is a big part of that. As we start practice or we do our workouts, our guys know how important it is. They know what the standards are. They know what the demands are. And they know the impact it has, not just on the success, but the overall, the mentality of the game. There's, there's so many mentality um, you know, challenges that are going on throughout the course of a basketball game. And, and rebounding is one of those things that you know, the team that usually benefits there is the more aggressive team. And so for us, we recognize the strength in our opponent and how great they are going to the offensive boards. Uh, they go with force. They, you know, they're one of the top teams in the country. They've got multiple guys. They've got great size, length, athleticism. And so we recognize that strength of theirs. And yet we feel like on a daily basis the things that we do prepare us for these type of opportunities, and we're confident in that plan. Coach, back right here. Kevin Sweeney, SI, you talked about Taman's leadership and you know the, the example he sets. I know uh, Coach Hurley was in here earlier talking about guys who are, are drama-free. I'm curious, in, in this day and age with all the stuff that goes on you know, with the portal and you know, the 
pre-portal and tampering, like how valuable has it been for your program to have a leader like that who seems to be at least pretty drama free? Yeah, he doesn't get caught up in a whole lot of nonsense. He keeps his focus on, on what matters, what's important, um, being the, you know, what he can do and who he can be. Um, I don't know a whole lot about like social media and all those things and what guys do in their free time, but if, if you're to see Taman on a daily basis, you see a focused guy, you see a guy who has great maturity, uh, mental makeup, um, just stays in that space, in that zone every single day. Coach Front Lefter. TJ and Costable <coughs> from the Chicago Sun Times. This defense that you guys boast, was the willingness from your guys always there to buy into that end of the floor and, and the culture you guys are developing defensively? We try to be very intentional and mindful in the recruiting process to look at young people that, um, that understand to develop, to play at your best, to be the best team you can be, that defending and showing unity on that side of the basketball is extremely important. Yet, everybody can talk about it. It takes the daily commitment every single day to guard the basketball, you know, um, close out, block out, all these things that are so important to being good defensively. And we've been fortunate. Our guys have developed a sense of pride in doing that. I really felt like earlier in the season, our first home conference game, we played a really good Houston team as good as, you know, maybe as good as any team in the country. And when you get a win like that, <laughs> and it was, excuse me, <coughs> it was in the 50s. So, you know, you want to score more. You want to have more prolific offensive output. What happens is they say, well, this can be really good for us if we buy in and continue to buy in and stay the course defensively, end up winning the game 57-53. But you feel so great in that locker room after that all those sacrifices, all that hard work, all that unity, all that time, you beat the number two ranked team in the country. I truly believe that gave our guys a greater sense of purpose and confidence. It's one thing to say buy-in, but they also need that validation that says the hard work is paying off, and that was a big night for us. Coach, all the way left here. Hey, uh, Trevor has Boston Globe. Just some thoughts on Hassan's uh, evolution as a player and his maturity and obviously come back from an injury. He's really hit a stride late in the season. Hassan, at the conclusion of last season, we had very direct communication. And he had said to me that he wanted more. He wanted to, he wanted to earn more. He wanted to develop more. He wanted to take those steps. And I remember looking at him and saying, well, how hard are you going to work for it? What, what changes – what choices are you going to make on a daily basis so that those things happen? Because it's your choice to do those things. And you see what he did in the weight room and the weight that he's gained, um, his confidence in terms of finishing, facilitating offense. Uh, and then defensively, he's all over the place, extremely disruptive, ball screen defense, post defense, on the glass, rim protection. So – Hassan has given us a whole added dimension, especially here late in the season. You've seen over the last couple weeks the threat that he poses as a lob threat at the rim, going to get you know, a basketball up at 12 feet, which not many guys can get to. Um, his, the speed he plays with, uh, the mental focus that he's brought to the table, and he's really, uh, he's really elevated our team. Any other questions out? <coughs> right here to the right, Coach. Matt Rybaltowski with Forbes. TJ, you, you may have dealt with this at UNLV with being in the backyard of the world's largest sports books, but in light of what happened at Temple, how much is being done to mitigate the risk of point shaving throughout the sport? Well, I think, you know, from our uh, vantage point, we try to educate the young men in our program and utilize the resources that we have available, you know, to make sure that they're mindful that, they know, um, you know, what decisions need to be made, what the conduct and the standards are at all times, and, and we do everything we can. Our administration does a tremendous job bringing in people from the outside and trying to educate them. So we'll continue just like we do in all aspects for the young men in our program. We want to put them in position to be successful. Uh, we hold it as a high priority to do the right thing. And so for us, we will continue to, to keep our focus there. 
Anything else out there? If uh, you'll bear with me, Coach, I'm going to try and take a question here from Zoom. Uh, let me unmute you. Paul, from USA Today, if you're able to speak, uh, if you're still with us, you can yeah. go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, TJ. Um, I actually want to ask you about your fashion sense. Uh, hopefully you don't decline this question. Um, can you tell me when and, and why you decided to go with polos and, and what the, the purpose of that was? And if you ever hear anything from fans or people behind the bench who say, hey, what size is your shirt, Coach, or anything of that regard? There you go, Goodman. You got the kind of question you wanted, right? <laughs> um, I'd say this. It's always interesting to me in coaching that – I'm a guy that believes a lot in discipline, regimen, accountability, daily habits. It's always interesting when coaches demand that the players all wear the same thing and then the coaches all wear something different. It's always kind of stuck with me of like, what would I say to a player on the team if they say, well, why are all the coaches wearing different things and why are we wearing the same thing? So when we came to Iowa State, came back for the head coaching opportunity, it was important to me that how everybody dressed on a daily basis was exactly the same. So if you were to be at one of our practices, everybody, every manager, support staff member, coach, we all wear the same exact thing every single day. It's a shorts and T-shirts uh, with our Category 5 culture with our saying on the back in practice. And I'd say the same thing makes sense to me in a game setting of why wouldn't we all want to look our, – our team and our coaching staff is, is in unity. And one way – that we can show that is, you know, through how we dress, through what we wear, and that we're all on the same page and we're all connected. And so for us, we've taken a lot of pride in everybody doing that. Now, if you specifically mean the size of my polo shirt, if that's really what we're getting at here and you didn't really care a whole lot about the culture piece, I'd say to you, uh, we started at a bigger size. Now, when you have my frame and you're built more like a wrestler than a basketball coach, it can become a challenging because come challenging because I have short arms. So if you wear this size polo, the arms are long and hanging down past your elbows. If you wear this polo, it looks smaller. So it gives me a greater sense of self-discipline each day that I've got to fit into the one that our good friend Jeff Goodman would call a schmedium, <laughs> uh, that I wear that size and opt for that. It helps me stay as disciplined and accountable as I need to be to our program wearing that shirt. Any follow-ups to that, Jeff? <laughs> if there's uh, no other questions, Coach, what's we'll your head back. Good luck tomorrow night. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right. Just a quick reminder that Hammond Communications will post a recording of this press conference in the Media Hub at ncaa.veritone.com. Transcripts will be provided by ASAP. We posted shortly. Thank you for joining us today. See you tomorrow night.